Perfect. I'd like to open up the floor to Jeff and Nicole. You guys have been doing such a beautiful job receiving questions, answering them when you know how. Uh, so I'll start with you, Nicole. Okay. Well, a lot of people want to know how they can integrate it with their own Microsoft environments. There's a lot of technical questions. So I'm curious where people can get answers for that. And then are there some opportunities in creating um, plugins in a marketplace for some of these things that don't exist right now? Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, so um, it's a good question. And so we have a lot of architectural patterns that we publish. Um, and, um, you know, so you could definitely go to the documentation that I was referring to earlier. So GitHub, which is like the repository of a lot of, you know, uh, developer content that we produce. So even that example I showed you, the demo I showed you with ChatGPT on HR data is actually publicly available for you to take and deploy as is. So the, 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 all the code behind it, we make it available in our GitHub repository. So, so yeah, so we have a lot of these different architectural patterns. We um, also have what we call solution accelerators. So you don't have to like build everything from scratch. You can just simply take and deploy. And Microsoft typically works with a huge partner ecosystem. So we have many partners that are building automated solutions on top of this technology, right? Depending on the industry. So for example, uh, in the healthcare industry, which is some, an area that I focus on closely, we have partners like Epic that are using, like that example I showed you about responding to patient emails as a doctor. Epic, which is the largest ISV system in the health industry, is already building that using the OpenAI model. So you'll have partner solutions also that take advantage of this technology. And so yeah, a lot of different resources to go to. And yeah, you can, the beauty of this is it's an API. So you can certainly, if you're in the business of building plugins or building you know, integration solutions on top of it. That is what we want you to do. Because Microsoft, we are very clear, we are a platform company. We offer the plumbing, but we let it, we give it up to the partners or, you know, to you as a developer yourself to actually build the house and build those other components. But yes, absolutely possible. Thank you. Perfect, Chad. Yeah, thank you. I, we we definitely are getting a lot of questions about how to utilize these tools well. And I think, as you explained, Shuram, Azure is really a platform. It's a platform that allows you to develop a large array of different tools that isn't necessarily geared towards a business owner specifically. And and you mentioned at the beginning of, of this conversation that there are already products in Microsoft, like around Office 365, that are incorporating Copilot type tools where a lot of business owners, especially with small businesses, may get access to, to play with these tools and, and get a taste of what AI can do. Do you have any sense in a product roadmap perspective? I know this isn't the product you represent of when some of those co-pilot tools will become more broadly available to sort of, sort of a home user of these types of things like Microsoft Word or Excel. Yeah, so that's it's that definitely the plan is to make sure that it's accessible to everybody and it's not going to be limited to like a certain, you know, audience or a certain enterprise uh, size or whatever, right? Because it's so early, the initial launch of some of these co-pilot capabilities, for example, in the office tools, was opened up for a limited, what we call a private preview so that we can have a test customer base that can give us feedback so we can improve these products before we make them publicly available to everybody that's using these tools, right? So that's definitely the plan. And then for example, even Bing, use, Bing uses these models to power the responses, the GPT-4 models. Initially it was launched as a preview that you have to subscribe and access to, but today you can go, anybody can go to Bing and you can get that same functionality. So that chat GPT interface, is available in Bing, except it also has up-to-date information like a search engine. So you can ask, ask questions about today's events as an example, but powered by GPT models. So yeah, so um, I don't think there will be a barrier for entry uh, on any of the first party integration tools uh, because it's only been like three months since we generally made this models available. So we are working on a super fast time frame to get things out of preview into general availability as soon as possible. Thank you, Shuram. Yeah, I think a lot of the a lot of the businesses I talk to nowadays are so excited to jump in. But with being with this being such a new and novel innovation, a lot of times if you want to be an early adopter, you have to be comfortable with things changing, being at a more technical level. And if you really need to be in a position where you as a business owner can use a turnkey solution, then those are probably a few months down the road before rolling out in terms of having full user interfaces and turnkey functionality. Absolutely. Now 
I, I think we gotta we've got to ask about SEO, Jeff. <laughs> Jeff runs an SEO firm. Uh, you know, Google has been, uh, I know you've never heard of it, but Google is the search engine and it's pretty popular among pretty much the entire world. Um, uh, Jeff, I'd love for you to ask a question that's on the top of your mind about SEO uh, sure. and, and how uh, AI is going to change search and how ChatGPT and Microsoft's partnership with it is going to change the Google versus Microsoft dynamic. Yeah, absolutely. What a loaded question to ask. Uh, and thank you, Sharon, for entertaining this. I think for me, it's it's been interesting to see just from a market share perspective, how quickly adoption of AI can 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 impact utilization of these tools. For me, as a cert, someone who specializes in SEO, I think one of my biggest concerns is actually probably largely a humanitarian concern, which is right now, even without AI generating content, um, companies like Saltbox or, or other businesses are generating a lot of content that are designed specifically to gain search engine visibility. And, and that can create some issues, especially around things related to your financials or your or your health or, or your money, these types of situations. Um, I'm just curious if you've got a personal perspective, whether it's Microsoft or not, in terms of, of how we as a, as a society kind of... Um, monitor what is in these search engines and make sure the information we are using is not just a mass hallucination of, of largely generated AI generated content, but actually kind of valuable and authoritative information. Do you have yeah. any pulse on, on how, how we keep a, keep our, keep our finger on that and make sure that we're not, you know, creating a problem? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And, you know, it's a, obviously an evolving topic, but if you see the way Bing has actually done this already, so they're not just going after the, GPT model and just letting it answer questions for you, right? So they're combining the GPT model's capability with its traditional indexed content. Um, and then more importantly, also as part of the answer, citing the sources where that information is coming from, right? So that's one way to make sure that not only do you get an answer that's human-like, but there is information about what is that source of content coming from. And that can give you an idea of you know, whether this is actually um, generated uh, in a responsible manner and all that good stuff. So there's various techniques um, that are uh, emerging, but search engine optimization in general, right, is, is a key use case. I think this is where this technology can be put to use, but like you said, with a lot of careful design. So there is prompt engineering that happens, whether it's Bing or whether it's even other tools that, you know, like we have the Office 365, we have a business chat UI that can actually go search against all of the graph data that we have in Office. But they just don't expose the search result back. They actually prompt engineer in such a way that it's you know sticking to certain facts and it's not hallucinating. Whether it's 100% accurate, absolutely not, because these are probabilistic models. So there's always going to be the possibility that it can go and hallucinate. And that is where you know the human in the loop, that feedback mechanism, all of that come into play. But no, it's a great question. I think, you know, there are a lot of patterns emerging and best practices, and I'm pretty sure there'll be a lot more coming as, you know, people start building these tools in the future. But uh, you can use like Bing as like maybe one example of how, you know, some of that is already being done. Yeah, I, I found some of the things like source citation to be such a good tool for combating what could be a machine hallucination or just bad information in the first place. So that seems like a an important innovation. Yeah, the one other thing I'll add before I forget is so there's also like frameworks about evaluating these models that are coming into play. So there is a framework called evals that sort of like takes output, compares it to like real sources and says, okay, well, you know, how did the model do? Again, early days, but there are open source uh, community activity around, you know, those sorts of frameworks where some of the evaluations about large language models are coming, coming into focus. Yeah, and you, mean, you mentioned open source and also just Microsoft's kind of general mention or sort of mission to democratize AI for the masses. What is your either either personal or or, or perspective in general on the trade-offs between closed source uh, language models like what we're using with OpenAI and, and ChatGPT versus some of these open source models? There was an interesting paper recently or, or a leak from Google where they talked about that they don't really have a moat, that there's an immense amount of amazing things happening in the open source community. What's your view on the trade-offs of, of kind of closed source corporate driven innovation and some of the open source um, behavior on these things? Yeah, so there are so there are different models that we have where, you know, you could 
you know, deploy it and, you know, run it locally and, and things like that, right? That is already available as part of the Azure AI stack. And then we have like the machine learning platform where you could actually take any of those open source models and, you know, sort of implement it yourself. Like, you know, we have a partnership with Hugging Face and the models that Hugging Face offers can actually be, you know, deployed and downloaded and built. For the open AI, the GPT model specifically, just because it's humongous, it's huge, it just requires this sort of distributed computing capability that's running on multiple, you know, GPUs, et cetera, that is hard to like, you know, basically have somebody just download it and, you know, set it up on your computer. And yeah, and, I, would, and, I would need like a server rack with terabytes and terabytes. Of... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think we're trying to find every GPU available out there yeah. to, uh, you know, make sure that all of our customers can, first of all, get access to it. But at the same time, yeah, I think that's a dilemma that we are in. But again, having said that, so early, I'm pretty sure as these trends evolve, um, you know, companies like Microsoft will definitely look at what is the right thing to do in a responsible manner. Luckily, it's way above my pay grade to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. But uh, but having said that, I'm also an eager audience like yourselves on how this, uh, you know, this uh, whole area is going to go into in the future. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we have one last question before we wrap up. And I did want to invite folks who haven't yet to participate in the poll. Let us know how we did today and if you'd like any more information. So this is a question from Vanessa Tinsley. And I think it's it beautifully encapsulates kind of one of the examples of where people get stuck in terms of implementation of these tools. She wrote, we have Azure, but we don't really understand how to effectively deploy it in our organization. So we hired someone to help, but it was a waste of money. We're a small nonprofit organization. We don't have any IT experts on staff. We would like to find some uh, live training from Microsoft or a vetted expert to help us leverage this amazing tech. What advice would you give to Vanessa? Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry to hear that. You know, um, she didn't have a good experience with, um, you know, with uh, with, with that um, in general. Um, you know, so we do have, we try our best to have like a lot of learning academy. There's lots of, you know, YouTube videos. There is actually tutorials on our documentation page to help get started based on different, um, you know, skill sets that you bring to the table. Um, and so, you know, so that, so those are all great starting points, but for using this technology, particularly, right, this chat GPT or this GPT type technologies, particularly, again, the documentation that I was pointing to earlier has actually a set of step-by-step -step on how you'd use it it is super easy to get started, right? I mean, having said that, yeah, I mean, we there should be some base Azure knowledge in terms of at least like being able to spin up a subscription and deploy a resource. And that sort of base fundamental, Azure fundamentals, as we call it, there are many options available out there from a learning perspective. Uh, and we also have learning partners uh, that we can recommend. And our, uh, our, you know, I think our website actually has a great job of listing who our certified learning partners are. Uh, but yeah, there's lots of self-based learning. I mean, it's all about like, you know, going and learning these days right on your own. Um, you know, maybe I just go ask ChatGPT, how do you get started running Azure and see what it says? Yeah, you're muted. Sorry, I'm going to invite Vanessa. She's raising her hand. Um, I'm going to invite you to talk if you like, and you can ask your question directly. Super. Thank you so much, Dan. It's been an amazing, amazing um session. So um, and that's, I just wanted to comment and ask because that's always the response is like, go online and learn it for yourself. But I'm running a nonprofit. I'm the executive director. I don't have someone that I can hand this and say, go learn this and deploy it. Uh, we have, you know, we know like we could get our website there. We, you know, we want to build an app. There's a million things that Azure could do that would transform our organization. And we are like power using chat GPT for, um, but I would love to be able to do that in Asia so that we you know, would have that, that protection and could do things that are more appropriate to our organization. So just looking for like, what would be like, if you're talking to like Asia for dummies and that would be me and people who already have more on their plate, I'm working 70 hours a week to make this thing go like, what would you say, like, this is the one thing that you should do 
um, first that would help you um, push this? Or do you have someone locally that you guys can recommend that we could partner with that could really help us deploy this? Because I honestly believe this would be a game changer for our organization. We're Power Microsoft users. We have studios and Surface Pros everywhere. Um, and so this is really, for us, definitely the logical next step. But we have been stuck. We've, been, we've had Azure for three years and we're just stuck. Nobody's been able to um, even do the, the most simple things for us. Yeah, it's a great question. So we do have like an organization that works with um, you know nonprofits, um, et cetera, startups. So why don't I take it as a follow-up? I don't have a, like a, a, a good answer for you as to here is a resource to go to and things like that. But having said that, I think I should do some due diligence on my side and like investigate what others that are in your situation are doing. And I probably should talk to some of my teammates and get that information for you. So if you don't mind like sending a follow-up, uh, we'll love to get that information to you. Thank so, you. Super helpful. Vanessa, thank, mm -hmm. thank you for the question and, and uh, glad to have you be the representative of a lot of people because we know you're not alone in asking this. Um, so that actually leads kind of to my next question for you uh, before we wrap up, which is if you're willing um, to do a little bit of homework for us. There's that question that Vanessa asked, and then there were a handful of others that we didn't get to uh, by virtue of the fact that, you know, we only had this limited amount of time. Would you be willing to maybe hop back on a call with me? Um, we'll give you the questions ahead of time and we can just kind of tackle them in an AMA. Um, we have, I mean, we did such a good job. I want to just commend my, my colleagues. We went through more than 60 questions, um, in addition to the ones that we asked live. So I'm very proud of what we were able to accomplish in these two hours, but you know, there's still a lot more to go. So, um, Sri Ram, would that be possible that maybe we could hop on a, on a follow-up AMA and invite others to join? Yeah, absolutely. Love to do that. All right. Wonderful.